Alt class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Budapest. I hope everybody has had a great week, and you're looking forward to a fantastic weekend. I hope you're all staying strong and healthy and productive. Hi, Pachu. Hi, Uzbekhan. Welcome, students. Uh, today, we are looking at the IELTS listening section. Specifically, we are going to talk about how to get high scores. We're going to practice for those high scores, and we're going to focus on parts three and parts four of the listening section from our fourth exam that's found in your second exam book. Welcome, Sammy. Nice to see our members. These lessons are brought to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Definitely check us out there for the general IELTS. Visit us at gieltshelp.com. We've got lots and lots of materials to help you succeed in your next IELTS exam on these websites, everyone. Uh, for the academic, it's this blue background. You can click that big red button to join the premium package and I'll give you a special discount code. You can use the code R4TYJ to save uh, 20% when you use that code today. So just click that join button and then click the apply coupon code button. Uh, for the general IELTS, it's this green background. You can also use this code there, R4TYJ, when you click that big red button to join the premium package. Welcome, Mohammed. Nice to see you. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. All right, everyone. So uh, again, aehelp.com, gltshelp.com. Today we're looking at uh, section three here, continuing from yesterday. We did part one and two yesterday. If you missed yesterday's class, no problem. If you were here, that's great. You will be able to add up your total scores. And I bet people that were here yesterday remember that uh, part three was something about zoos. And then part four, anybody remember what part four was about? So I showed you that trick yesterday where you can kind of look ahead and identify the topics of the sections during the instruction time. Um, and we saw that uh, part uh, two was about a tour, Mohammed. Part three that we're going to do right now uh, is something about zoos. And then part four is something about turtles. That's right, Moria. Very good, Kim. Yeah, something about a turtle. Uh, very nice. So you all remembered the turtle. Very visual. It's good. Picture. Use your visual prowess uh, in these listening uh, sections. Visualize the information. See the information clearly in your head. All right. That's great. Uh, if anybody ever has qu uh, questions for me, just send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com. Um, tomorrow we'll have more classes. We'll have a question and answer session for members. And then we'll also have a speaking part two session for everyone. All right. Uh, let's get into part three. Listening. Um, I'm going to play the audio. If uh, for some reason it's uh, unclear, let me know. I'll try to uh, check. There's that turtle, Carolina. Um, nice emoji, little cute turtle. Uh, if the sound is not clear, let me know. Uh, if it's quiet, please use a headset. Turn up the volume. If the sound is crackling, then let me know. I'll try to uh, catch that. Okay. Um, and uh, importantly, as you're answering these listening questions, uh, please put your answers on a separate piece of paper or document, not in the chat, um, just so you give everybody a fair chance to answer on their own. Okay, so I'm going to hop over to our website here where we find the audio and my student account. Uh, just give me a moment here to start up this audio. All right, not the computer-based practice exams, but I'm going to go to the... IELTS audio CDs here, there we go. And this is going to be CD four because it's test number four and it will be uh, listening section three, so track three. Okay, everyone, here we go. So listen and answer and visualize, pay attention to keywords and go with the flow. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions. 21 to 26.
listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired aims in life. Clearly, these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within the zoo. Moreover, in many cases, animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points. Most notably, that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified. Though they may not be perfect, I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point, but such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever, and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, 
But is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live? I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And in that half minute, you should always uh, check your answers, students, uh, so you know that you haven't made a mistake uh, with um, the instructions or spelling, for example. Now, let's go through the answers together, and I'll give you some tips and strategies as we do this. So question 21, you had to identify basically who is who uh, in this panel discussion. So here we had uh, Dr. Henry Gergen and Dr. Gloria Mesto uh, talking about zoos and their ethical values. Okay. Um, so here we go. Uh, Z, I see your question. So Z is saying, why do I find this test tough? Um, Z, this particular speaking, you have three accents. You have a British accent, a Canadian accent, and a New Zealand accent. That's one of the reasons, possibly. The other one is the topic. They're talking about the ethics of zoos. You can get this kind of situation in the aisle, so be prepared, okay? So number one, uh, Dr. Henry Gergen is from where? University of Edinburgh or Trinity College? If you get the first one right, you'll get the second one right as well. Uh, number one is A and number two is B. So it's A and B. Very good, Carolina. Very good, Sammy. Very good, Erkin. Nice job, all right? Um, the uh, host introduces them. So here I have with me today Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh, and I have uh, Dr. Gloria Mesto, uh, who is a biologist or something from Trinity College. So he introduces who they are, what their job is, uh, and uh, where they're from. So you have to um, really pay attention right from the beginning, okay? Um, it, you have to be very, very careful uh, everyone not to daydream. Okay. Daydreaming is really bad. Uh, does everybody know that word daydreaming daydream? There's a synonym for that as well. Um, because sometimes the answers come really, really quickly in the beginning, like for this, uh, answer one and two. So, uh, just a kind of a word of caution. I know many people don't do this, but it happens to the best of us. Uh, you must not daydream um, there's another way to say that it's zone out. Okay. Zone out, uh, during any part of the listening, because, uh, at times the answers come very quickly, especially in, uh, parts three and four. Okay. So careful. I've seen students lose marks because they're like, Oh, whoa, what's going on? Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, whoop, did I just miss that? Okay. Anyway, um, you have a 50, 50 chance of guessing it, but that's not a good place to be. You want to get these right. So stay focused throughout. Okay. Yeah. Anas says it's being distracted by thoughts. Yeah. Um, all right. Now here, question 22 to 24, a reminder from yesterday, the strategy for this is to take notes. So hopefully you remembered this from yesterday's class that here you should have been um, writing down animals are treated inhumanely, animals should not be prisoners, and then uh, you would have gotten the right answers. So uh, Abdu Kolimov says it's A, B, and F. Were you taking notes or no? Okay. Maybe you were Abdu Kolimov. Abdu Kolikov, because you got them right. Okay. So Abdu Kolikov, um, were you taking notes? Because if yes, you did a good job. Okay. So the correct answers are um, A, B, and F. Okay. A, B, and F. Okay. 
So animals uh, are treated inhumanely in zoos. Animals are persons. So uh, he says that, okay, They're, they have identities. Animals have feelings. They're like persons, okay? And F, uh, they are fundamentally wrong. So uh, the person says they're fundamentally wrong. The sh animals should not be caged up, okay? A, B, and F. Very good if you got those. Again, if you're taking notes, you should have written these down because the um, Henry Gergen professor says these very specifically. Okay, here, uh, write no more than two words and or a number for each answer. Number 25, in order to improve conditions for zoo animals, zoos must be held to something of animal treatment. Now here... It says no more than two words. So it means that some answers might be one word. Some answers will be uh, two words, okay? Anas, very nice. Higher standards. Yeah, higher standards. Standards. Uh, with a plural, make sure you get that S. Uh, pay attention to the spelling. You can write all capitals, but uh, it's uh, higher standards, okay? Um, Rohan Prasad, uh, C is not correct here because uh, C is not the conserv. So zoos um, are not bad for the conservation of species. They're good. Okay, so you have to remember, um, Rohan, the question. Okay, so which three of the following are arguments given against zoos, not for zoos? So Rohan, you're right. They said that it helps the conservation of species. But that's not against zoos, that's in support of zoos. So you really have to pay attention to the question here. Okay, I just uh, wanted to go back and answer Rohan's question. Uh, Christine, you are allowed to take notes during the listening. Yes, you can write down ideas. Absolutely, Christine. Uh, this is Christine Redfield. Um, however, you have to be very careful when you're writing down notes because notes distract you from the listening. So you don't want to write down a whole bunch of notes. That's a really bad idea. Only for some questions, Christian. Christian, sorry, Christian. Um, and uh, one of those types of questions is this one, this multi, multiple choice. That's where you want to write down notes. But you, you don't want to write down lots of notes because then you'll miss answers, okay? So let me make a note of that, Christian, because that's a really good question and I think that's important. Uh, for everybody. So, uh, yes, you can write down notes in the listening, and it's a good idea for some questions, okay? So, yes, you can take notes uh, during the listening section. It is a good idea to do this for some question types like uh, the multi multiple choice questions but do not take lots of notes uh, because you will miss answers okay so only some only a few for the right questions okay very important. It's a good question. All right. Um, so uh, number 26. Uh, while zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues that this function could also be performed by animal something. So here we have animal as an adjective, and here we have a noun. Now, if you know the word, uh, you can guess this, right? Erkin Saliev says animal preserve, okay? Um, by animal preserve, preserves are countable, okay? By animal preserves, uh, okay? Um, can also be performed by an animal preserve, but we don't have this an, so it has to be animal preserves uh, with an es. Plurals are very important. If you write, um, can also be performed by animal preserve, 
you'll get it wrong because there's no article a uh, or an in this case because of the vowel a, uh, right? So animal preserves, you have to have the plural es. Be very careful. Pay attention for the article before the, um, the noun or the adjective noun, okay? All right. Okay, now I had the microphone a little bit further from the speaker for this number 27, but you can almost guess this just from the context. And logic is really helpful. And uh, Oga Beck, um, Oman Kulov, and Samuel both agree that it makes sense to say education. So enjoyment and education are two key positive attributes of zoos. Um, if you miss a question, if you don't hear it, okay, use logic. So uh, logic is very helpful, okay? Uh, think about what happens when you go to a zoo. When I go to a zoo, I love looking at the animals and I learn a lot about the animals. So it makes sense that enjoyment and education are two of the key aspects, right? Um, how many of you, when you think about zoos or going to the zoo, remember that you have fun at the zoo and you learn about animals, where they live, what they eat, okay? Sammy says, logic is our friend. Yeah, logic is our friend, Sammy. Logic can also be our savior in some cases. It can uh, save our lives even. Um, yeah, even during this COVID situation, using logic is a smart idea, like washing hands uh, regularly, right? Um, so, uh, Anas is asking, do we get extra time at the end of the computer-based format? Um, no, I don't believe that you do. You don't get uh, 10 minutes like in the, um, uh, like in the, uh, paper-based, uh, Carolina says you get three minutes. You get three minutes. Yeah, so you get much less time on us because uh, in the paper-based uh, exam on us, you actually have to transfer your answers. So you have to copy them over. So you get 10 minutes. But in the um, computer-based exam, you get, uh, as Carolina is saying, three minutes uh, be to review your answers. So it's fair, right, uh, in that case. So in this way, the paper-based is maybe a bit friendlier, but there are also advantages to the computer-based. Thank you, Carolina, for giving us the exact uh, answer to that. So it's three minutes that you get, okay, in the computer-based. All right, um, okay, so let's keep going here. Now, we had some multiple choice, and I saw a couple people, you know, complain here that I wasn't scrolling fast enough um, to these multiple choice. That's not actually a problem. Multiple choice, you should be able to answer even after you heard the information, even if you didn't get to it in time, okay? Makbuba, I see your comment there. Makbuba says, recently I took my IELTS exam and today I got the results. Overall, band seven, listening eight, reading seven, writing six, and speaking 6.5. I'm immensely grateful for you for my speaking. This is my first attempt. Very nice, Makbuba. Good job. Well done, okay? Fantastic, all right? Okay, so uh, again, going back to multiple choice, um, you should not need to stare at multiple choice questions to get these correct, okay? The best way to get multiple choice questions correct is to listen for the answer, okay? So when you listen for the answer, you should be able to answer these. In fact, it's often better to hear the answer and then answer these than stare at them and then wait for the answer, okay? students make mistakes more when they're waiting, staring at the question, okay? So I can see that Sweet Sweet is saying it's C. Mohammed Azat agrees. He's unsure. Yeah, he says, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it. He really emphasizes that. When you hear a speaker emphasize language like, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. it's very likely going to be an answer, okay? So listen for emphasis, all right? Um, when you hear emphasis in the audio, it's most likely uh, critical for one of the answers uh, on your sheet, okay? So 
Good, Makbuba. That's fantastic. All right, so keep that in mind, okay? So this is another tip, okay? When you hear a speaker emphasize a point in the audio, it is very, very likely a key point for an answer. Okay, so listen for that intonation, okay? And um, the speaker does that here. So the speaker says, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that. And indeed, it is the correct answer here for C. He is unsure. Okay, so listen for emphasis. All right. Okay, um, here we go with uh, 29. Uh, what is the interesting question? Okay, now you see the quotations here. That means you can listen specifically for this vocabulary because this means that it is a direct quote. So the speaker will use this exact language, okay? So the speaker says, hmm, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure, okay? Um, is it A, whether zoos are ethical, whether the inspirational value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects, or C, whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos? A, B, or C for 29. Mohammed is not very good. Yeah, it was B. So here the speaker said, I'm not sure if their inspirational value outweighs their negatives. That's a tough one, okay? All right, number 30, last question for this part. What do the guests agree on? So they all agree on this, and it makes logical sense. Okay. Uh, Christian, it's not that they're transferred automatically. They're recorded automatically. So when you're typing your answers into the quote-unquote answer sheet, Christian, they, they are being recorded. That is your ans Those are your answers. Okay. So there's no actual answer sheet separately in the computer-based. Okay. All right. Um, so number 30, zoo conditions need to be improved. Zoos are unethical. The inspiration value of zoos is unethical. If you didn't hear this, think about it yourself, right? Uh, what would I agree on should be done with zoos? And I think when people go to zoos, we all feel this way that eh, the cages should be much, much bigger. The animals should have more room. Uh, to move around, they, they need to look a bit happier. And if you think about that, then all of us will come up with A. Does anybody else feel that way when you go and visit a zoo, or is it just me? Uh, when I see zoos, I'm happy to see those animals because I don't get the chance otherwise to see such incredible, unique animals. But I always do get the feeling of, wow, that's a really small space for this animal. In fact, I just saw a bird exhibit the other day in uh, the uh, eagle's... Um, cage. I was just thinking, wow, for an eagle to be in such a small space, it's, it's just kind of sad. Um, so Sammy says, I feel the same. Yeah, okay, so I'm not the only one. All right, yeah. So other people feel that, you know, always more space. In fact, one of the animals I feel the most um, empathy for, I don't know if you've ever seen them, are the polar bears in their kind of exhibit. Um, polar bears, uh, use a lot of space in their real habitat. We're talking hundreds of kilometers of space. And so whenever I see the polar bears, I always see them just walking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in their 20 meter, 30 meter cage. And it's just, it's sad. Um, anyway, uh, that's zoos. That's part three. Um, those are my two bits. Uh, Azat, you got uh, seven out of 10. That's okay. So uh, for part three, add up your scores. Uh, think about how much you got. For part three, you should your score should be, in the worst case scenario, it should be six to ten, okay, um, out of your ten, okay. If you are less than six, if your score is here, um, then this is uh, bad. It's not good, okay. Um, you need to try to get uh, over six, okay. Six or over. Sweet, sweet. Nine out of ten is fantastic. Okay. All right. So Lucas says, I've only been to the zoo once. All right, Lucas. 
All right, um, here we go. So uh, let's get into uh, part four, the final part. Part four is, in most cases, a lecture uh, on a topic, okay? And uh, you have to listen carefully. There's no breaks. So part four just goes, goes, goes from start to finish. Um, it's fast. It usually has the highest degree of vocabulary. But one nice part of uh, part four is that uh, it's often just a monologue. So it's one uh, person speaking. So you can kind of, uh, you don't have to pay attention to multiple uh, speakers. Okay, everyone. So once more, get ready to answer. Get your pencils, papers, uh, tablets, phones, computer keyboards ready. And um, write down your answers separately, not in the chat. Give everyone a chance. So don't put your answer in the chat. Put it on a separate piece of paper. Here we go. I'm going to play it. If the audio is crackling for some reason, let me know. I'll adjust. Okay. Um, here we go. So uh, part four. Uh, again, this is out of our website at ahelp.com where we have original exams for you developed by experts. Uh, here we go. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America, and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings away from many of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometers around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtle's migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometer per hour. This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveler. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap, illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north, towards the cold waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around, instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. 
they know exactly when to zig and zag to optimize their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about one in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, let's do this. So let's go through the answers together. Um, again, uh, it's a lecture, it's quite fast. You have to pay attention to keywords and emphasis here is very important. So uh, the uh, speaker begins and says, the loggerhead turtle has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. So lay its eggs was quite clearly emphasized by this professor. Um, so you should have picked that up that this answer was coming very quickly. The sandy beaches of, and I see Manjot wrote the correct answer, but did not capitalize the F. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Florida. Yeah, very good. So Florida it is. Capital F. It's the name of a U.S. state, of course. So you have to have that capital F. Florida. Very good. All right. Let's keep going. So... Uh, after hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. The ocean is safer than the shore because it has fewer what? So uh, it's a noun here. It should be clear. It's safer. That word, safer, gives you an idea. Um, and the answer, that's right, Victor, Sammy, Rashika, very good. It's predators, predators, plural. Now, again, it's okay to write all capitals. Uh, but I definitely do recommend you to practice using correct capitalization. The turtles embark on a journey that will take them something kilometers around the Atlantic. So here we know it's a number. And of course, it's going to be a big number because it's around the Atlantic Ocean. So you should be thinking thousands of kilometers. Uh, and in fact, it is 13 thousand kilometers one three zero 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 that's all you need okay z says 13,000 or 13k if you write 13k make sure to capitalize the k okay so clear big k 13k okay um again here the safest is just with the three zeros um but 13k is okay all right 13,000 okay um so while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerhead's journey especially notable is the extreme something pace it travels at. There were a couple of words that you could use here. Uh, the simplest word that you could have used is extremely slow or even better, sluggish. Okay, a slug is a type of animal. It's a snail that doesn't have a house. Um, and uh, here it's sluggish, S-L-U-G-G-I-S-H. So slug used as an adjective, sluggish pace. Sluggish means slow. Very good. Okay. All right, number 35. The entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. Um, yeah, 17,000 hours is okay, or better yet is two years. Okay, so 17,000 hours, sure. Um, two years, a little bit simpler. Okay, uh, two years is easier to write. They'll probably take 17,000 hours as well, but two years, it's faster and easier to write. Always choose the easier option whenever possible. Okay. Two years in this case is definitely the easier option. It's faster, especially if you're doing the computer-based exam. It's less keystrokes. Okay, here you had to complete this paragraph. This is all paraphrased, so uh, some words match with what the uh, professor is saying, but many words do not, okay? So as incredible as the loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive 
is that the loggerhead is a something. Very nice, Lucas. Good job. I can't read the Cyrillic, but uh, solitary is correct. So solitary. Very nice. Solitary means alone or lonely traveler. Lonely traveler. In the cartoons, they always show these loggerhead turtles traveling in groups, but like in Finding Nemo, but it's actually not true. They travel alone. Okay. All right. Traversing the ocean on its uh, own for years at a time. What a, a an extremely humble life. Slowly swimming across the Atlantic Ocean. Quite amazing. Uh, scientific research has in recent years told us that it is through a connection with the Earth's something that the turtles find their way around the ocean. Yeah, magnetic field. Very good. Lots of students got that. Magnetic field of course the earth is spinning we have a magnetic field um, that the turtle finds their way around two words in this case both of those are needed um, and uh, they find their way around the ocean for example the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of a country here which country is that akbar shubhamai urkin very nice it's portugal big p very important portugal Okay, that makes them change their direction and head for Northwest Africa. Yeah, because if they keep going past Portugal, they're going to end up in the cold oceans of the UK and then even colder up in Scandinavia and around Russia. And, uh, it's a little bit cold, I think, for the turtles' liking. These turtles seem to like warmer waters more. All right. Uh, possessing more than a simple compass, the loggerhead can innately sense its what? Um, longitude. If you know the word longitude, uh, then you will also uh, know this word here, most likely. Ah, Victor, very good. Rashika, yeah, it's your latitude. So think of long, okay, and lat for lateral, all right? So uh, longitude, here's the earth. This is the earth. Uh, this is your longitude, okay? Um, this is your latitude, all right? So by knowing your longitude and your latitude, you can position yourself, okay? Uh, these are two very important words, especially for people who love traveling and adventure, uh, going out for hikes. Um, if you ever get lost in a big forest and you're on a radio, uh, you might get somebody asking you, what is your latitude, longitude, will come find you, okay? So, or if you're lost on, in the ocean, right? So those word, knowing those words in English could really help you. All right, here you had to do a little bit of simple math. Approximately what percentage of hatchlings, to hatch means to come out of the egg, okay? Hatchling is a newborn creature that just popped out of the egg. So even a chick, so a brand new chicken, a little chick, little cute little yellow furry chicks, uh, they're also hatchlings, okay? So any animal that just came out of its eggshell is a hatchling. How many of these hatchlings make it back to the breeding ground in Florida? A, 0.025%, 2, 2.5% or 25%. Um, they said one out of 4,000 and that's A, right? So one out of 4,000 is 0.025%. Ooh, that's a really um, little percentage here. Uh, Mohammed, you don't have to write anything here. You just write the letter A into your answer sheet, okay? All right, that's all you have to do. You don't have to write the words. Otherwise, you'd write 0.025%. Those are the words that you would write. Okay, cool. So there you go. That was part four. Uh, great job, everyone. Good for hanging in there. All right. Yeah, Salma, on those spelling mistakes, you got to be careful. One way to avoid spelling mistakes is to really write a lot and play spelling games. Uh, there are lots of great spelling games for your mobile phone. Um, Salman, so you can download some spelling games. Some of them are actually quite fun and uh, you can uh, play those spelling games, okay? All right, everyone. So how did you do, what did you get out of um, 40? Um, in, on our website here at the very, very bottom, 
Uh, we do have a score calculator where you can calculate your scores for the listening and the reading sections. Let me darken this up a bit and then you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Um, so Abdu Kholikyob says I uh, got 37. Okay, so if I write 37 here, uh, you'll see that 37 is a band score of 8.5. So there you can just quickly check how you did. All right, Victor says 32. Um, 32 would be 7.5. Uh, Nomon Adizov uh, says 33. 33 Nomon is 7.5. Okay. Uh, Moria 38 is going to be 8.5. It's just one away from 9. Okay. 38 is still 8.5. 39 is 9. And 40 is 9. Okay. Uh, Mohammed Azad says 28. 28 is 6.5. Okay. Uh, Ariful says 25. Uh, 25 is a band 6. All right, so you can check that out on the website, everyone. Uh, both uh, academic and general IELTSHelp.com has that uh, score calculator at the very, very, very bottom as one of the kind of added positives um, for the website. So there it is. Okay. All right, everyone, that's it for today. Tomorrow, I will be back again with a question and answer session for members and, um, and then a speaking part two. Somebody was asking about speaking. So I'll have a speaking part two cue card where everybody can join the chat. So make sure to get in on those classes tomorrow. Um, you can see lots of HD videos with me and a couple other teachers as well and lots of students. Uh, AEHelp.com for academic IELTS, GLTSHelp.com for general. On both of those websites, you can now use the code R4TYJ and get that 20% discount. If it's late in your country, get some rest, have some sweet dreams, and hopefully I'll catch up with you tomorrow. I'm Adrian signing out for now from beautiful Central Europe. Much love to all of you. Bye, Carolina. Bye, Axe. Bye, Rohit.